All right, this is chapter 21 continued, picking up with slide 34. So creating new vessels is called angiogenesis. So you're, hopefully you're learning genesis means to form, angio refers to, to vessels, vasculature. And the hormone that's going to start this process is vascular endothelial growth factor. And you often hear this one called VEGF. It happens in the embryo as you develop organs. And so the organs send out this hormone that actually directs the growth of the blood vessels. And it will also occur in response to factors released by cells that are oxygen starved. So here's an example. If you start growing a tumor in your body, which is an un controllable group of your own cells. Once the tumor gets to a certain size, the center cells of the tumor are not gonna get enough oxygen and they would begin to die. So those cells in the middle of the tumor will actually send out VEGF and it will cause your body to grow a new blood vessel right into the tumor so the tumor gets the oxygen it needs. That sucks, huh? So there's some of our cancer treatments are designed at blocking angiogenesis so that the tumors can't get enough oxygen. Another thing in cardiac muscle in response to a chronically constricted or occluded vessel like we just talked about in coronary artery disease, sometimes you will also try to grow new vessels. All right, so veins collect the blood from the capillaries and return it to the heart. Now looking at the com comparison between arteries and veins, veins have bigger diameters, thinner walls, and lower blood pressure. Blood pressure drops off really quickly, going from the heart to the arteries to the arterioles to almost zero down in the capillaries. No blood pressure at all. And now we have to move this blood all the way back up to the heart without another pump. So we have to come up with another strategy, or at least your body had to come up with another strategy. Venules are the tiniest veins, and they're the first veins after the capillary beds. Then they pass the blood up to medium-sized veins. They have a thin tunica media and a few muscle cells, and they have longitudinal bundles of elastic fibers. So they're gonna be running the lengthwise direction on the medium-sized vein. Larger veins have all three layers. They have a thick external layer and a thin media layer. And these are the size veins that usually have the valves. Okay, so imagine the blood is coming back from the bottom of your foot. And once it gets up in your calf, there will be a valve in the back of your calf. So once the blood gets to a certain height, it can't fall back down into your foot. Now, so what are we gonna use to move, since we don't have a heart, what are we gonna use to move the blood up your leg? Well, it's actually your skeletal muscles. The valves and the veins are positioned so that they're kind of embedded in within your muscles or behind your muscles. So when your muscle contracts, it puts pressure on the vein and squeezes the blood up to the next valve. So if you don't move your leg for a long time, you don't move the blood, the venous blood out of your foot and that, that stuff starts to collect and press very gently on nerve endings and you won't realize it. And the blood will pool and your foot will swell up a little bit and then you're not going to feel anything unless you move your foot. All of a sudden, those nerve endings that have been kind of compressed by all that blood pooling in your foot are going to let you know that they are compressed. You guys know this by your foot falling asleep and that pins and needles feeling. Okay, so these valves are actually made of folds of the innermost lining and compression of the veins by skeletal muscles is what pushes the blood towards the heart. Now, if the walls of the veins pool too often and they begin to stretch, well then the valves weaken and the blood makes the walls of the veins stretch and you can get varicose veins if they're in your legs or you can get hemorrhoids, unfortunately, if they are in the rectum and anus. Not a fun experience. Okay, so here is what those venous veins look like. So here we're draining blood from the foot, okay? We come up here to behind the calf muscle. And so when you walk and this muscle is squeezing, we push the blood from this valve up to this valve. And blood that was in the foot makes it up to this valve and fills in the gap, okay? And when the blood tries to run back down, it snaps shut and it can't get through. It just pools in these little cups. Pretty cool. So where is most of your blood? Well, 30 to 35% of it right now is in your heart, in your arteries, and in your capillaries. That doesn't seem like very much, does it? That's because 65 to 70% of it is in your veins. 
A third of your venous blood is in your large networks that are in your liver, your bone marrow, and in your skin. And here's another graphic. All right. So we talked about overstretching a vein and you can get varicose veins. What about your other vessels? Can they be overstretched? Well, we look at their ability to stretch and recoil as their capacitance. There is a relationship between the blood volume and pressure and veins, which are capacitance vessels because they lack most of the elastic tissues, stretch more than arteries. And so this is where we keep our blood most of the time, in these larger capacitance vessels. Systemic veins constrict in response to blood loss, which increasing amounts of blood in the arterial system and capillaries if we squeeze down on the veins. Okay, so we're going to start talking about some more formulas. Total capillary blood flow equals your cardiac output. So what does that mean? The amount that is going through your capillaries has to equal the amount that left your heart, right? That was cardiac output. And it is determined by the pressure of the blood and resistance in the system. Now, what is resistance? So imagine you have a tube, right? And you're gonna put red blood cells down through the tube. If the red blood cells are scraping the walls of the vessel as they're going along, they're giving some friction and they're not gonna move fast, as fast as the ones that are in the center of the tube and are not touching the walls. That scraping is resistance. So larger blood vessels have a lower resistance. They usually have a larger or faster blood flow through them. The blood pressure is generated by the heart and it's to overcome the resistance. Absolute pressure is less important than the pressure gradient. That means just like everything else, we go from an area of higher pressure to lower pressure. And that is our pressure gradient, the changes, the changes in pressure. Flow is proportional to the pressure gradient divided by the resistance. All right, so how do we measure pressure? We have our blood pressure, which is usually an arterial pressure. So we're looking at the pressure in an artery and we measure it in millimeters of mercury. So we have a device that allows us to measure the pressure by looking at a column of mercury within a glass cylinder. There's also capillary hydrostatic pressure. Now this is not one we measure really, but this is the pressure that is still within the bloodstream as it enters the capillary beds. Any leftover blood pressure from the heart squeezing. And then we have venous pressure, which is whatever pressure is in the venous system. So circulatory pressure must overcome total peripheral resistance. So the resistance of the entire cardiovascular system and the change in pressure from its highest point to its lowest point is about 85 millimeters of mercury. Now we talked about again, total peripheral resistance. What is resistance? Well, it would be resistance within each of the vessels. It would have to do with the thickness of the blood and something we haven't really talked about yet called turbulence. So vascular resistance is the scraping of the blood cells as they're going through the vessel and creating friction. It depends on the length of the vessel and the vessel diameter. Now, when you're stopped growing, your vessel length is constant, so you're not gonna change the length anymore. And you can change your vessel diameter by either making it bigger through vasodilation or making it smaller through vasoconstriction. Resistance increases as vessel diameter decreases. So imagine, again, a garden hose, okay? A garden hose is a good example. If you have a garden hose and you begin squeezing the walls of the hose, the water is going to have increased pressure, but it's gonna come out. It's not gonna be going through the hose as quickly, right? So that would be increasing the resistance. Viscosity is the thickness of the blood. How many formed elements are there? How many plasma proteins are there? So all of the molecules and suspended materials in a liquid will contribute to its viscosity. Whole blood has a viscosity that's about four times more than the viscosity of water. So again, blood literally is thicker than water, okay? So the thicker the blood is, the more viscous, the higher the um, resistance is going to be. The smaller the diameter of the vessel, the higher the resistance is going to be. And here's the last one, turbulence. 
liquids don't always move exactly in a straight line. So any time that there's an irregular shape or there's a bump or there's a plaque, it's going to cause the blood to have these little eddies, these little swirls that are not pushing it forward. And those are like a little spiral of blood flow that's going backwards, so it increases the resistance in the vessel. So let's take a look here. Friction and vessel length. So the smaller the length, right? Here, resistance to flow is one, flow is one. A longer vessel has a higher resistance to flow is two. Friction and vessel luminal diameter. The larger the diameter, the lower the resistance, the lower the friction. And then down here is that one I was just showing you, turbulence. So this is a vessel that has two plaques that narrow it in one spot. So as the blood is coming straight through, some of it can get through mostly straight, but anything that bounces and hits the plaque is gonna kind of swirl backwards or swirl backwards from the front. And this is going to cause the blood flow to not move as evenly forward as it would. So this is increasing resistance. This is the turbulence, but it's going to increase resistance. So let's look at pressures. Again, looking at vessel luminal diameters, total cross-sectional areas, pressures of individual areas, and velocity of blood flow. So how fast is the blood moving? So if we were just looking at the vessel luminal diameter, veins have the largest diameters, especially the two largest veins, your superior and inferior vena cava, right? Then you have your regular large or medium-sized veins here and venules. These definitely have the largest diameters. Arteries, your aorta and your pulmonary trunk, have a pretty close in diameter, right? And then we get into our muscular arteries and arterioles. So the ones that have the tiniest diameters are our capillaries. So having tiny diameters is going to increase resistance, right? Resistance is going to increase blood pressure. Now, which area has the most cross-sectional area? So where do we have most internal vessel or interiors of vessels? Notice, vena cava and our biggest arteries are not it. We have more cross-sectional area inside arterioles, capillaries, and venules with the bulk of those being inside capillaries, okay? And then blood pressure is highest in your largest arteries. And as we move away from the heart, as you would expect, the pressure drops and drops and drops. Okay. How fast does the blood move? It moves pretty fast in your large arteries, slows down a bit in your muscular arteries, slows way down in arterioles, and then kind of holds it steady through capillaries. And it goes kind of steady through venules. And then as we go back into veins and vena cava, it picks up speed again. Why would you want your blood flow to be slowest at the capillaries? Well, in the capillaries where we're waiting, we're waiting for diffusion to happen. So we have to have the oxygen in the blood go out of the blood, the nutrients in the blood move out of the blood, the carbon dioxide and waste that are in the interstitial fluid move into the blood. So we have all this exchange happening. We really slow down the velocity of blood flow in the area it counts most, the capillaries. Let's go back to those pressures. So when we're looking at arterial blood pressure, so we're looking at the arteries, remember that's where it's highest, we're just leaving the heart. There is the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. Now remember from the last chapter, systole is squeezing of the heart, diastole is relaxation. So we have two pressures. When the heart ventricles are squeezing, the blood pressure goes up. That's the peak pressure. It's not gonna get any higher than that. So that is your systolic blood pressure. And then when the ventricles relax, the blood pressure drops down, okay? And it's not gonna drop any lower. That is your diastolic pressure. So it's like your maximum and minimum all within a few seconds of each other. Your pulse pressure is the difference between those two numbers. So a normal healthy blood pressure is 120 over 80. So the systolic pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury. The diastolic pressure is 80 millimeters of mercury. Your pulse pressure would be 40 millimeters of mercury. 
And then there's this really weird one. It's called your mean arterial pressure. You know, means usually mean averages. So you take your lowest pressure, your diastolic, and you add one third of your pulse pressure, right? So our pulse pressure was 40. Our mean arterial pressure uh, would be our 80 plus a third of 40, which is mm, a little more than 12. So like 92 point something would be our mean arterial pressure. So again, normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. Anything over that can go into areas pre-hypertension and then hypertension is diagnosed if it's higher than 140 over 90. Hypotension is having unusually low blood pressure, sometimes 100 over 70. All right, so arterial walls we saw have lots of elastic tissue, so they will have elastic rebound. So when blood pressure goes up, Arterial walls are able to stretch a little bit. And then when the blood pressure drops, they snap back. This actually helps smooth out blood flow so that it doesn't come in spurts. It keeps the blood moving during diastole and smooths out the pressure. So the farther we get away from the heart, the less pressure waves we experience. So your mean arterial pressure and pulse pressure decrease the farther you get away from the heart. Mean arterial pressure declines as the branches become smaller and more numerous, and pulse pressure drops because of elastic rebound. So this is looking at, as you're close to the heart, this would be squeeze of the heart, relax of the heart, squeeze of the heart, relax of the heart. So that's what it would be doing, right? That's your pulse pressures. But your mean arterial pressure makes this a smooth curve. And then by the time you get to capillaries, this is all gone. Venous pressure. Now, we do have blood pressure in the veins, although we don't have anything being driven by the heart. We still have fluid, right? And the amount of venous pressure determines how much blood gets back into your heart in each venous return, how much goes into the right atrium between heartbeats. There is a low effective pressure and low resistance in your veins. Veins are wide and floppy, large diameters. We try to reduce resistance as much as possible. And we use our skeletal muscles to compress to serve as our pump since we no longer have the pressure from the heart. If leg muscles are immobilized, blood su supply to the brain is reduced and fainting may result. Many of you may have been in like choirs or things like that and we always had somebody who did not remember to not lock their knees and they would pass out in the middle of a concert. There is also something called the respiratory pump. So the skeletal muscles really help with your legs the respiratory pump kind of helps move stuff um, from the upper extremities. Now, you have an advantage. Gravity pulls things down. So getting blood back from your head, your shoulders, into your chest is not as difficult as it is coming up all the way up your legs. But we also have the help of your breathing. So when you inhale and exhale and move your thoracic cavity back and forth, you actually are moving blood through the venous system there as well. All right, so I'm going to stop this one here, and I'll pick up the next presentation at slide 61.